Hey guys, Ethan here from Extreme RC 4x4. Today I got a new build to work on, a new truck to build parts for, I guess. Um, bought it from RPP, in case you're wondering, I always uh, shop at RPP. Uh, just because they offer free shipping and they've always treated me right but as you can see I got a UMG 10 um, main reason I wanted this one over say an RTR or just the chassis kit is with this one I get the cool new kit transmission I have plenty of experience with the original AX10 transmission so um, no need for another one when I can try something new uh, along with that uh, when you go to this from the chassis kit I get the body the wheels and tires um, I think that's pretty much it as far as things that I wouldn't get if I got the chassis kit but um, I already have some plans in mind for this but I think I want to get it built before I make too many decisions uh, I'm going to try to leave it pretty close to stock because that way I'll be able to make parts for it easier but I'm going to try and film this video kind of how I did my TRX4 build where I time lapse it and then I'll cut in and talk about something if I find something interesting should be a pretty straightforward build these scx 10s are uh, pretty simple trucks compared to the other vehicles on the market nowadays um, i was considering an scx 10 3 but um, i think if i want to go to a portal axle rig um, i just much rather would have a t-rex 4 so i'll go ahead and open this up we can look at what we got for parts Um, I don't know if you guys want to look at the box. I haven't even really looked at it myself, but here you can see the transmission I'm talking about where it kind of looks like it has a transfer case coming off the back side. Um, the body does flip back on this truck, but I'm not even sure if I'm going to stick with this body or not. I'm going to use the body just probably on a, a different frame. So go ahead and get right into it. I'll stop talking. Oh, there it is. The Unimog. So that's awesome. Just open the box and see that right there. Um, really sweet Unimog body. I really wish Axie would have done the Unimog with portal axles, though. I think they kind of missed that opportunity. But even get an interior for the body. I guess I, I didn't necessarily realize that. I saw it on the parts, but I didn't think it was actually um, just included. And then, of course, we have the bed for it. Um, that needs to be trimmed, of course. The sides, they're pretty much just bed sides with the cage. And then it looks like we have the center of the bed here. Sorry, I'm not really too set up for this giant box on the table. But, um, tires as well. Look a, di a little bit different than I had imagined they would, but um, large tread blocks and they're spaced apart. I was imagining they'd be tighter. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I ordered this maybe a month ago now and just now getting a chance to uh, work on it. I thought this is a good time to open the box up for you guys tonight because I'm not doing any machining. I'm all caught up on stuff. But I have the beadlock wheels here with the center caps. I have messed with these wheels before on a, a, a customer 6x6. But then we have bags of parts. I'm just going to unload all this stuff. Um, I can get the box off the table.
This bag actually looks like it has quite a bit of details for the interior and mirrors and all that good stuff. That's really awesome to see. It's It's been a while since I've built an axial truck. So should be interesting to put this all together. I'm really most interested in this transmission um, because as you guys know, I put that AX10 transmission and everything. And if this transmission is as good, um, maybe I'll have to start using these. Uh, absolute ton of rod ends. I'm sure there'll be a ton of spare parts after we build these. All the axial rigs always have lots of spare parts. So, I didn't see, instructions must be in this bag. First thing I saw just uh, when I opened this, even though it just went to this parts page, is Axial still has the 1.9 rip saw tires. That's crazy. Those are like the original tires from my Axial Dingo build, which was probably more than 10 years ago now at this point. I don't necessarily have a set of electronics set aside for this yet I think I'm just gonna build it as a roller first and then figure out what I want to do with it so it looks like we start right away with building axles so I'm gonna clear this area out and put you guys on time-lapse and hopefully you guys get to enjoy seeing the build progress a little bit faster Alright guys, so what I'm doing here with um, these bearings, since they're open, is um, taking the grease and packing them like a wheel bearing. Um, if you've never done that before, basically I'm just trying to pack grease in it to where it's coming out the back side. And the reason for this is just making sure the bearings are well lubricated before I get this all assembled and I uh, don't want to have to take it apart so just a quick tip Alright guys, so I'm building these steering knuckles right now with the axle shaft assembly and I'm just going to show you a quick little tip because sometimes the tolerances can be a little bit too tight um, for just pushing everything together. So I'm putting this big inside bearing on first, uh, just put some grease on it and then we'll take our knuckle and uh, I find it easier to put the bearing on with the axle shaft and we can just pull it through here and then put some grease where this outer bearing is gonna go just to make it easier to put in and I'll take this outside bearing and it gets about halfway in and then I can't push it any further so what you can do though is at this point in the build you have two of the exact same bearings as this outside so we'll put those two onto the axle shaft the only thing you will need is uh, a wheel nut which you can probably find in one of these hardware bags if you don't have one just sitting around and then i'll hold the axle shaft with my hand and the knuckle 
and we're just going to tighten it and use this as a press to get that bearing in there. And then it bottoms out, the bearing is in, so I can start backing it off and take everything back apart. And doing this doesn't really put any additional stress on anything, it just makes assembling it easier. We'll take these two extra bearings off and everything still spins nicely. Uh, it's just an easy way to press those bearings in when the tolerances are just too tight. All right guys, so I thought I was short on bearings, but it turns out that I just put the wrong bearings in the wrong place. These are actually, these two larger bearings actually need to go on the inside of the axle. So I'm gonna take that apart and make sure I get it put together correctly. Alright guys, just want to point out a little detail here that I notice um, coming from someone who the last truck I built is a Traxxas. Um, just a little thing like uh, putting the screws into these lower links here on the Traxxas truck, this outside one, the hole would be large enough that the screw just slides in and then it only really threads into the back side. Um, on here, you thread into both so you can't really slide this in to align everything like you would on the Traxxas. Um, I understand the Axial SCX-102 is an older design compared to when the TRX-4 came out but um, just small touches like that they really start to notice after you build the TRX-4. Um, almost shortcuts that have been taken on this. Um, just small touches like that that are really kind of lacking, I guess. Not really hating on this, just um, that's something I noticed coming from the TRX-4 build. Alright guys, pro tip for building your shocks, sorry I'm not really a pro, but um, what I like to do when I'm building my shocks is actually use grease where all these seals go. I think it helps keep uh, the oil in better than not using grease. So I'll put grease in the end first, then our first o-ring. And we'll put a little bit of grease on that o-ring to seal it off. Then we have this plastic spacer that needs to go in here. And following the plastic spacer, a little bit of grease. And then our final o-ring will go in. And 
that should have a layer of grease on it for my greasy glove by now. And then I need to find the caps. Here it is. And if you really want to, you can put some grease inside the cap. But uh, a lot of people complain about their shocks leaking oil, so any preventative measure that you can take to help stop that is, um, I guess, a good precaution to take while you have the truck so far apart or uh, not so nearly together. But um, I've been doing this for years and I think it helps uh, not only lubricate the shaft but to um, keep the oil from coming out. So uh, just a quick little tip, hope it helps you guys out. Alright guys, so I'm wrapping up for the night, uh, been at this for a couple hours now, I, I don't even remember what time I started, but it's about 11.45 right now, I got all the axles built, the links done as well, shocks, and the transmission. I would say everything went pretty smoothly. Um, aside for the fact that I was not really reading the instructions super carefully and I installed the wrong bearing in the axles and then I had to take them apart and reassemble them, but that wasn't too much of a hiccup, but um, I'm just not really used to reading the instructions, I guess. Normally I just know how all this stuff goes together, but this is pretty new to me. Uh, all this Axial SCX-102 stuff but uh, I will say I do like the one-piece axle housing. What I'm talking about is the C-hubs don't bolt on. They're just molded in. I know a lot of people were pretty upset about that when Axial did this. But honestly, I think it looks cleaner. And um, I have never even broken C-hubs on an axle before. So I would be surprised if I do on this truck, I guess. But um, yeah, everything looks good. As far as I can see, I, I'm interested to see how the high pinion axles perform compared to the regular standard pinion because they have the uh, interesting cut on the gears that I haven't messed with before. Uh, hopefully there should be like pretty much no bump steer with this as long as they get the rest of the geometry right because the steering link and the track bar link are exactly the same and um, that's what you're supposed to have for the best geometry. Uh, in the rear, uh, no complaints, everything went together well. I thought there was like some caps that went on the end of the axle, but you just use screws. So uh, I guess that's pretty simple, very straightforward. Um, building the links, you just have to be careful, make sure you look at the diagrams. I haven't built links again with all these uh, crazy bent rod ends in a while uh, especially because Traxxas already assembles all the rod ends for you um, another thing that I got to do that I haven't done in a while is build shocks uh, these I don't I've never had a set of these aluminum axial shocks before I guess I didn't even realize that this truck was gonna come with them but um, I remember these shocks came out on like the icon Jeep Wrangler Rubicon way way back when and I still haven't got my hands on them until now uh, they are functioning very smooth because uh, I must have done a good job building them but uh, yeah pretty neat I like the aluminum it looks good I don't know if it will serve uh, much of a function or not but it looks good uh, the transmission uh, again, a lot of instruction following, and there's a, a few points where I was pretty confused 
on what was going on but once i kept moving forward things kind of started to make sense like uh in some of the pictures it looks like the bearing is supposed to be butting up against the gear and it's just not uh doing that until you assemble it all and then it kind of makes sense um, if you guys can understand where the heck I'm coming from but I, I like how the transfer case is made it to the transmission you don't have to have a drive shaft between them because we all know that's just another place for there to be slop um, could have been a good opportunity for Axial to do an over underdrive transfer case here just leave another output out here and kind of figure that out but uh, I guess they missed that opportunity, sadly. It would have been cool to see, especially since that's pretty popular now. But uh, there's a whole lot of nothing going on right about here. Uh, I can really tell that this was designed to be a two-speed. I just, um, maybe I'll have to get the gears to make it a two-speed eventually and take this apart and rebuild it. But... Uh, no electronics for this truck at this point. I think I'm just going to assemble it a roller and uh, deal with electronics from there. So uh, the rest of this build should be pretty straightforward. I think I'm done with the grease, which is always a good thing. Uh, not that I hate dealing with it. It just makes the rest of the build cleaner. So I'm uh, going to be building the frame, drive shafts, and just assembling everything. So should go pretty quick after this and uh, I guess I'll be back at this after the weekend so you guys will jump right to that but um, a couple hours in just kind of enjoying the build not trying to pound it out or anything and uh, hope you guys are enjoying seeing the time-lapse footage and just checking in every once in a while. All right, guys. So I'm back working on the drive shafts here, and I just wanted to show you when you're putting these together. It doesn't mention it at all in here, but it's kind of important to phase your drive shafts. And basically, all that means is get the U joints so they're in the same position. So, what I like to look at on these, at least, is this slot right there. And then we're gonna look at the slot on this end also, and we're gonna try and line those up and just make sure that you get them so that they're in the same position. And that way you won't get any excessive chatter or vibration if you ever put these drive shafts at an excessive angle. Um, I, my thoughts on these drive shafts, I usually use the old style of axial drive shaft just because I like it better I guess. Not any particular problem with this, I just don't really like these caps on the end because they slip on and off so easily and it exposes that pin so my concern is that if I'm ever working on this down the road and this cap slides off once everything's worn out or the pins just going to be falling out and I'm going to be fighting them. Uh, if you know the old style of drive shafts, uh, those pins were locked on when you installed the plastic part of the drive shaft to the U-joint. So I guess time will tell, but that is something, a little design critique there.
Alright guys, I'm going to show you how I'm assembling these beadlock wheels because I'm doing some things a little bit different than the manual. Uh, the first thing I'm doing is taking the foams out of the tires and trimming uh, like a 45 degree off of this inside. And the reason I'm doing that is because the foam is incredibly wide and our beadlock wheels here are three piece. Um, essentially what I'm trying to do is make the center as narrow as these internal beadlock rings. And the reason for that is that I don't want all this extra here to get caught between this ring and the sidewall of the tire that's going to be trying to seat in that ring. So by trimming that out, it makes the insulation a lot easier and the tire will set evenly around the wheel. So I'm just using these angled body scissors and I'm taking off probably from the sidewall when I am have it all compressed here, it looks like about 3 eighths of an inch. Um, and you wanna have the same amount on the inside too because we're trying to cut it like a 45 degree angle even though it probably won't look like that when I'm done cutting. And then we can take this piece out and you can see just taking off like the inside sidewall it looks like we'll do the same thing to the other side too Alright, so that looks pretty good. Some of my earlier ones didn't look too pretty, but it shouldn't have an impact on performance or at least not a major impact. And just shove it back into the tire and make sure that once you get it back in there, you get it seated nice and evenly. And the other thing I'm doing is that these center rings here have some small vent holes right there and right here and so I'm taking these two and a half millimeter screws and plugging them because I like the feel of a pneumatic tire I guess you'd call it because there's no air venting out I like that kind of springiness that it gets um, I've just never been a huge fan of vented tires, and I know some people really are a huge fan of vented tires, but it's just not for me. It's really up to personal preference, and if I were to do this again, I'd probably install the screws from the inside of the wheel. This way you can take them out uh, if you wanted to, but I'm installing all mine from the outside or the inside of the tire. Uh, just because I'm pretty sure, 99% sure, I'll never want to remove them. But um, even if I were to remove them, I'd probably be working with a different tire anyways. And I screw them in enough so that the heads of the screws are... Where the heck am I at? So that the head of the screw is even with the top sides of this ring and these are 2.5 by 6 
nothing? Yes, 2.5 by 6 millimeter screws. 2.5 by 4 would probably be perfect. No idea if they make that size. Now we'll put this ring on the inside of the tire. And once you have the ring in there, you'll see that it's a lot easier. There's no foam that's really going to be getting between the sidewall like we were fighting with earlier, or at least I was. And if you, when you put these outside rings on. All right, so as I was saying, guys, when you're installing these outer rings, you'll want to take note of where the holes are on these internal rings and you can set it so that the holes are exposed like this or you could even set it like I had my first one before I realized they were vented you can cover up those holes with um, these rings if you wanted to so I like to leave them open because I have that screw sitting right there so it's not necessarily open but I have to align everything and take the back side ring and I'll start getting everything started I guess can be a little bit difficult to get these tires seated but it all just takes patience now once you have those first screws in you just want to go around the tire and make sure that the bead is actually set on that internal ring and you can do that by just pushing the sidewall into the center of the rim and we'll want to do that on both sides All right, so that looks pretty good. Nothing's evenly set yet. We don't need it to be. Just want to make sure we get that bead in the tire where it needs to be, on the rim where it needs to be, sorry. Then I'm gonna tighten in a star pattern until there's about a sixteenth of an inch um, of distance between the front and back rings. All right, so, and not all the way tight yet, but once we've done that and left ourselves a little bit of space, as you can see, between the halves, um, I like to pull this ring out so that we can get it evenly seated. You'll see um, as I pull it out, just like that. And then once we do that all the way around both sides, we'll know that everything is evenly seated. So your tires shouldn't be all wobbly and weird when you're driving them. And of course the front side as well. Uh, the camera keeps cutting off, but um, once you get those beads pulled around like that, uh, you shouldn't be able to pull the uh, locking bead out of the rim because we're so close to having it tight. And then once you have that done, you can snug the rest of them down and we're all set.
Alright guys, so I pretty much got the body completely uh, trimmed out now and all the holes reamed or drilled. Um, everything came out really nice. It was a little bit tricky. It's a pretty complex body with all these pieces in it. Um, and my only real concerns with this is it seems thinner than a Proland body. I mean, not incredibly thinner, but uh, there are some spots like this in the corners where it's all kind of crunched up and it's actually so thin on this bottom plate that I like blew through it with the reamer because uh, I was used to pushing as hard as on the rest of it and it's just really thin back here so um, I guess it is what it is I'm probably not even going to use the like flatbed roll bar setup on the back of this but um, yeah, it's just a little bit concerning I guess Hey guys, Ethan here. I just finished up the power wagon build and uh, here you can see, well it's not completely finished, I don't have electronics in it or have it painted yet, but uh, this is where it's going to sit for uh, now. I pretty much, like I told you guys, I bought this to make parts for it. So um, I think I'm going to use some of the parts off of this on some other projects uh, that you'll see down the road eventually. But um, talking about the build, uh, things that I'm going to just cover things that I don't like first so that it doesn't seem like I'm coming off uh, negative in the end. Uh, in some places on the body, it feels a little bit thin, and I understand why that is with the vacuum forming that they do for these Lexan bodies. Um, but it can be a little bit concerning, and uh, especially back here in the bed where I showed you guys, that's really thin. Um, uh, the only real issue that I found with this is that the rear lower links, the screws to mount them are like slightly too long. So tightened all the way, they rub against the drive shaft. So I needed to back those off just slightly. And uh, now it rolls just fine. Um, I guess we'll look at the chassis for a little bit first here. This whole front battery tray setup, sorry. Uh, this is one of the things, this is one of the reasons why I don't like the flippable body. I mean, it's pretty nice to have, but uh, also at times I'd like to just pull it off. I guess it's only two screws, so I shouldn't really be complaining. Uh, talking about this front battery tray, it's pretty neat how you have these adjustments side to side to uh, get your battery to sit firmly in here and not be wiggling all around. Uh, I did find this whole like battery tray front assembly to be pretty complicated putting it together, but um, it kind of started to make sense once I got it in the truck. Uh, that little tab right there and this little tab right there. Uh, actually have a small hole in them that run up to that piece right there that comes out the front and what that's actually for is a servo winch I really wish it would specify this in the instructions because I know there's a lot of people that have uh, 
no idea getting into the hobby what that is um, but what you do is one of these triangle mounts up here your steering servo mounts up here and then these triangular mounts actually would go right here and you put a uh, servo inch here and then you can run your cable through that which um, is I, I really like the engineering on that I just wish it would be mentioned in the instructions that it was there the transmission design is uh, definitely unique and something that I don't I haven't seen before um, I kind of wish they would start phasing this transmission into some of the other trucks but I have a feeling that there's just not a whole lot of benefit for them to be doing that especially when there's so many more parts to this transmission than the typical three gear transmission that Axial likes to use um, it's obviously built to be a two speed there's a lot of uh, space in here and there's actually even a hole for where the shifter would go uh, that ends up being plugged. But uh, you don't get a metal motor plate. This plastic seems pretty thick, so I uh, shouldn't have any issues with that, I don't think. Um, they did miss a pretty good opportunity to have an over-underdrive transmission. If you guys don't know what that is, basically uh, your front wheels will spin faster in the rears and that helps with uh, turning and hill climbing. So they could have, this main shaft that runs into the transfer case portion could have come all the way out with a drive shaft output on it. And uh, they would have been able to run the front axle faster than the rear and even have both outputs there to give people the option. Um, just would have been something nice to see, uh, especially if you're gonna go through the hassle and make this new transmission. Uh, you, the skid plate is included, another skid plate for the old mounting style if you want to put a three gear transmission in here or if you want to mount uh, element enduro transmission in here uh, which has the over under drive that I'm talking about. Um, other things, the receiver box is actually molded to this side tray. Um, I guess I didn't really realize that. So that's interesting how they're moving towards that. It kind of takes away some of your ability to customize, but I'm sure it makes things cheaper on their end to be able to do. Uh, the links are really nice. I like how the links look. Um, this new style that Axial has, I guess it's probably not relatively new, but new compared to the SCX-10-1. Uh, the pictures in the manual, you, sometimes you need to reference more than one in order to uh, kind of make sense of things. Something I really did like about this build is that there's hardly any lock nuts on it. And some that might not sound like a good thing to some people, but in cases like these upper links, uh, they all used to have lock nuts on the back side and they didn't used to have this part on the skid plate. So uh, by kind of incorporating it all into the skid plate, uh, it takes a lot of the hassle out of installing the links. I think even down here on the frame or not on the frame on the axles, uh, there's no uh, lock nuts either. Uh, I guess if you ever wanted to, you could just put longer hardware in and install lock nuts. And like I pointed out to you guys, where uh, the screws thread all through both pieces of plastic instead of being able to slip through and align things, they on parts like the axle, there's no uh, the holes are not adjusted so that the screws can slip through. But in the case of the track bar on the front here, I did notice that that the front hole is larger, so you can slide the screw through and align everything. So uh, I don't know if they have different people working on the designs, but it would be nice to see them incorporate uh, some of that design into the axles. Something I do like about the front axle, I think I mentioned to you guys that I do like this one piece uh, housing that they have going on here. It really does clean up the design a lot. And there's a bearing right here on the end of the axle. I think that's really good to see because it keeps dirt from getting down the axle shaft. Uh, some companies will only use a bearing at the differential, so that helps keep everything sealed. Um, one thing that I don't like, I guess, is that under full compression, the track bar actually hits the differential housing. 
so uh, you're not able to get full compression on the front axle. I'm sure it's the best they could do um, at the time, I guess, but uh, it would be nice to see that where it's not binding. It's actually, a, I feel like it limits the travel a pretty good amount. It's not really going to limit your articulation, just the uh, compression. Um, talking about the body, I really like what they did with the body. It's very detailed, but I think they did the details right. Uh, like the Element Enduro Trail Runner that I have, all the details are falling off of it. But these are really well attached in my opinion, where we have the O-rings behind them and then the body pins. Uh, in the case of the mirrors and the door handles, I like that the snorkel is actually screwed in place. That feels really nice and rigid. And especially the windshield wipers being screwed in place because you're able to tighten them down and they're not uh, flopping all over the windshield. Like in the case of my trail runner, it drives me insane because I'll have one wiper that's halfway up the windshield and the other one will still be down. Um, but they did a really nice job, in my opinion, on this cab. Uh, we even get a driver figure with, you get to select a different hat if you want. And the steering wheel actually looks like it's going through his hands. And that's a really nice touch to see. I was really not expecting to get an interior with this, but uh, Axial's always done a really great job on their half interiors. And this is something that I'd like to see uh, the market do more is these half interiors, because uh, even just being able to see this uh, looks a lot better than uh, having no interior. And I think it's really the perfect compromise between scale looks and uh, you know, having to do a full interior. The problem with a full interior is you really need to make room with the electronics and uh, in my opinion, it just becomes more hassle than it's worth. Um, that's just me. I kind of like to get that good mix of scale and performance and I think the half interior is uh, perfect for that. Um, the front grill I'm not going to install yet because I don't really like how it looks. Uh, this is how the front grille looks uh, with the square headlights and stuff. I think I'm going to do a CC hand front grille which has the round headlights which would be um, the same design as a true Unimog of this era. Um, I'm just not certain yet because I just looked up that grill and it's about $60 to do that so I have a feeling I'll end up doing it. I'm just... Uh, kind of still considering it right now that's that was a shocker on price um hmm all right the beadlock wheels they're a very unique design and i like what they did where the front face of the wheel is actually carrying the hub um that's something i haven't really seen before and um like i showed you guys once you trim the foams uh, everything seems to go a whole lot smoother I do like that they actually do include beadlock wheels. I don't like, uh, I don't actually ever use the glue on wheels anymore because uh, once you have a set of tires glued onto wheels, it really limits what you're able to do with those tires if you ever want to change wheels. So uh, it's good to see the beadlock wheels uh, starting to come as standard. Uh, the shocks are nice and smooth so far. Uh, axial shocks are prone to leaking, but hopefully with that grease in there like I installed, it shouldn't leak too bad. Uh, I've had decent luck with them in the past. I'm trying to think of anything else to point out to you guys about the truck. I guess if you're looking for, oh, and then the drive shafts, like I showed you guys how that kind of bugs me a little bit, but uh, if you're looking to build an entire truck like this, where you're gonna have to uh, assemble the shocks and assemble the links is the only real difference between a TRX-4 and this. Um, so this is a lot more in-depth than building, like a TRX-4 is just what I'm gonna compare it to because that's one of the most popular options right now. The TRX-4 will include all your electronics uh, in order to build one. 
So it's a much more plug and play unit than this, even though you don't get a body. But um, I still think this is a great option for somebody who wants to do the full build like this, where you're gonna need to buy electronics separately and then uh, do the soldering. But uh, it was an enjoyable build for me. I always enjoy putting these things together. I hope you guys like to see um, how it all came together so quickly. Uh, one thing I will take away from this though is that there's no rock sliders, uh, which is kind of a bummer to me because you're gonna be dragging the body, which uh, I do not like to see that. I always like to have some sort of protection here for these Lexan bodies. But um, other than that, everything is really well put together in my opinion. You even get the, the hubcaps that have the central inflation system kind of mocked up on them. But yeah, other than that guys, it was a good build and I would recommend it. I, this is my first experience with a 10-2 chassis. So hopefully we'll have good luck in the future. But anyways, guys, thank you very much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.